Good evening. It's certainly good to be with you this evening. This is truly a great joy to be with the brethren here uh, in this area. We're looking forward to our time being with you, uh, studying uh, the Word of God with you. My family and I enjoyed our evening uh, with Mark and, and uh, uh, Mindy and Jackie Walker. We're very thankful for them, grateful to be able to have a meal with them, be able to uh, enjoy their company. Uh, we had a great trip coming up here. It was a, a long trip. If you've ever made that trip between Memphis and Texas, uh, you know that it can be a, a long drive. Uh, it was difficult in some ways, uh, as it's already been mentioned. Uh, our oldest, excuse me, our oldest daughter uh, stayed behind. She's working. She's 17 years old. Uh, she is going to be graduating this year. Uh, she's a senior in high school. She's already uh, engaged to a young man in the congregation there where I preach. Uh, outstanding young man, uh, great family. Uh, his parents, grandparents uh, attend the Lake Country congregation. And so uh, we're very thrilled. But I would ask for your prayers because Carly and I are going through a, a transition. And, and I realized how difficult it was coming up here and leaving her at home uh, by herself. But if you know Artie, she has uh, no problem staying home by herself. She has her, her life all planned out, and she will be graduating May 23rd. And listen carefully, she's getting married May 25th. The other day, they sat down, and they let us know their plans and I said, oh, slow down. Just slow down a little bit. Uh, let dad process this. Uh, and so we're going through uh, some life changes, uh, but we're very, very excited about that. It's good to see you tonight, and I want to commend you for being here tonight. I realize tonight is, is Friday night, and back home in Texas, uh, Friday night is high school football. I know there's a lot of different things that you could be doing tonight, uh, but you're here uh, studying the Word of God, and that says something about you. And I appreciate your spiritual appetite for the Word of God. If you're visiting from the community, we want you to know that we're glad that you're here tonight to study God's Word with us as we search the Scriptures together. You can see our theme for the next few days has to do with remembrance. The Apostle Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13, as long as, as long as I'm in this earthly tabernacle, I'm going to stir you up by way of remembrance. We need to remember the power that is in the blood of Christ. We need to remember the value of the Lord's church. We need to understand the importance of evangelism. We need to remember the importance of bringing forth fruit unto God. And we need to remember the value of worshiping our great God. I realize that these are lessons that you've probably already heard before. But these are things that we need to be mindful of. And as the Apostle Peter would say, we need to be stirred up by way of remembrance. And so I'm looking forward to our study of God's word over the next few days. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll begin in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1, and we'll read down through verse number 6. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. Paul says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto us, his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentile should be fellow heirs into the same body and partakers 
of the promise in Christ Jesus by the gospel. As you consider the Apostle Paul's words here in Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 6, we see that the Apostle Paul refers to God's plan of redemption as a mystery. A mystery is is something that's hidden or, or kept secret but later revealed. That's the point that Paul is making in chapter 3, verse number 5, when he said, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. We can see from Paul's words concerning this mystery that this mystery sets forth man's salvation and the fellowship that we have with God. When we read verse 4, we see that it's very encouraging because the apostle Paul says concerning that mystery, whereby when you read, you can understand, that is, we can understand, we can know God's plan of redemption. Jesus said in John 8, verse number 32, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And so what we can conclude from this mystery is that what God wants more than anything is for us to be saved by coming to a knowledge of the truth that sets you free. The Apostle Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved by coming to a knowledge of the truth. As we consider this mystery, I want us to go back to the book of Genesis. And we see in Genesis chapter 3, sin's entrance into the world. Eve heard a lie, she believed a lie, She obeyed a lie. She took the forbidden fruit. She also gave to her husband. Again, sin's entrance into the world. However, God made it clear to Satan that he had a plan that would ultimately defeat him. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, God says, I will put enmity between thee and woman, between thy seed and her seed, It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. God made a promise and God never lost sight of that promise. The prophet Isaiah would tell us in Isaiah chapter 7 verse number 14. A virgin shall bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. The prophet Micah in Micah 5 verse 2 predicted Bethlehem of Judea where Jesus would be born. We also learn that all of these prophecies were fulfilled in Matthew 1, 21 through 23, when the Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus. The Apostle Paul would also affirm in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. You see, just as woman introduced sin into the world, she also introduced the Savior as the remedy for sin. The Apostle Paul would say that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. As we study this great mystery, one of the main points in God's plan, whether we're talking about salvation or The fellowship that we have with God is blood. The Bible speaks very early about blood. In studying the sacrifices in the book of Genesis, we realize though it may not always be stated, blood was present. Blood was shed. For example, in Genesis chapter 4, along with Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 4, we're informed that Abel, by faith, offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. God respected Abel's sacrifice because it was a blood sacrifice. If you would, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22, and we'll see another example of this. In Genesis chapter 22, in Genesis chapter 22, we see that the Lord commands Abraham to take his son Isaac to Mount Moriah and to offer him as a burnt offering. We see Abraham 
doing exactly what God told him to do. He got up early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He took two of his servants along with Isaac. And they would make that journey to Mount Moriah. When they came to the place where they were to worship, Abraham tells his servants, I and the lad will go yonder and will worship and will come to you again. Abraham took the wood for the sacrifice. He took the knife. He took the fire and they went together. And I want you to notice the question that Isaac asked in Genesis chapter 22, verse number 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here, I, here, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And I love how Abraham responds to this question in verse number 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Continue to read with me in verse number 9. And they came to the place which God told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Again, we see from this context that blood was shed. But we also learn something else from this context. Spiritually speaking, we see or we begin to learn about a substitutionary sacrifice. And Abraham said God would provide that substitutionary sacrifice. Spiritually speaking, we see that Jesus Christ is our substitutionary sacrifice. As we now look at the book of Exodus... We see in the book of Exodus that God's people were in Egyptian bondage. We learn in Exodus chapter 1 verse number 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. As you study the book of Exodus or the book of deliverance, we see the mighty arm of God being stretched forth and his power being proclaimed through the ten plagues. Each of the plagues that are set forth in the book of Exodus uh, would serve as an indictment against these Egyptian gods. By observing the first nine plagues, we see the mighty arm of God being stretched forth. We see God's power being proclaimed. And then we come to the tenth plague and we remember the Passover recorded in Exodus chapter 12. This is where God told his people to take a lamb without blemish. You remember God says you're to take the blood from that lamb and you were to strike it on the two sides of the doorpost and on the upper doorpost. And I want you to read with me in Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. We see that God explains why. In Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse number 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. The spiritual significance of the Passover is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We learn that Jesus Christ is our Passover. And then we come to the book of Leviticus. And we learn that the worst thing about sin, heaven knows it. In Proverbs 5, verse 21, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. But we also learn in the book of Leviticus that sacrifice provides a way to God. And that's why when you open the book of Leviticus and as you study the first six chapters, we see a detailed account of the sacrifices. We read about the burnt offering, the meal offering, the trespass offering, the sin offering. We read about all of these different sacrifices. And when you stop and think about those sacrifices, we understand that the blood would flow. And then we come to Leviticus chapter 16. And we read about the day of atonement. This is the day that the high priest would take off his priestly garments and put on the holy linen. He, he would step down and, and number himself a sinner among sinners. He would offer a sacrifice for himself and then for his household. And then he would offer a, a sacrifice for the people. On this day, Aaron uh, would take two goats and, and he would cast lots upon those goats. One lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. Aaron would, would bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and he would offer it as a sin offering to the Lord. Can you imagine the blood that would flow on that day? And this day came year after year. Sacrifice upon sacrifice. The day of atonement. And that didn't include all of the, the daily sacrifices that we read about in the book of Leviticus. Then we come to Leviticus chapter 17 verse number 11. And we see why it was necessary for blood to be shed. In Leviticus chapter 17 verse number 11. God says for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for the soul. For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Friends, in order for there to be atonement, there has to be blood. And then we turn to the Old Testament prophets. And as we consider the Old Testament prophets... We see that the, the great prophets of God spoke about offerings. They spoke about sacrifices. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53, 5 through 7, depicts Christ as the atoning lamb of God when he says, speaking of Christ, he was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. We also see that with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dough. So he opened not his mouth. Or we can turn to Zechariah chapter 13. And in Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 1, the prophet Zechariah speaks about a fountain that would be open for the cleansing of God's people. We can be assured that that fountain that would be open for the cleansing of God's people would be a fountain of blood. Now, if you would, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read a few passages from Hebrews chapter 10. By the way, we're still in the introduction here, okay? Hebrews chapter 10. Read with me beginning at verse number 1. 
For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now we have seen throughout the Old Testament that the Bible speaks about offerings. It speaks about sacrifices. But in Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 1, we learn that the old law was a shadow of good things to come. Those sacrifices that we've been studying, that we've been reading, are a shadow of good things to come. The New Testament is the substance that cast that shadow. In other words, when we read about Passover, when we read about the Day of Atonement, when we read about that fountain that would be open for the cleansing of God's people, we see that these were shadows that were cast by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the substance that foreshadowed those sacrifices. Now read with me beginning at verse number 5. And as you're reading verse number 5, we understand that the writer is now quoting from Psalm 40 verses 6 through 8. And the psalmist is speaking about Christ. Notice with me beginning at verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 10 beginning at verse number 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, the writer is speaking about Christ. He's speaking about the incarnation of Christ, the word becoming flesh. When he, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, as it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And so from Hebrews chapter 10, 5 through 9, we learn that Jesus Christ was given a body that allowed him to be a sacrifice. God gave him a body so Christ could provide a sacrifice. You remember what Abraham told his son? God will provide. And that's what God did through his son. He provided a substitutionary sacrifice for sin. We also learn through the sacrifice of Christ, Jesus Christ became our Passover, as we mentioned from 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. But as I study the Passover of Exodus chapter 12, I can't study the Passover without being mindful of blood, without being mindful of the blood of Jesus Christ. And as I think about Jesus having a body that allowed him to be that sacrifice, as we've noticed already from the book of Leviticus, it reminds me in sacrificing himself, Jesus Christ provided atonement for sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. As we read through Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, the blood of bulls and goats could not perfect the worshipers. The blood of bulls and goats could not purge the conscience. And we see that the blood of bulls and goats could not forgive sin on their own. 
There was a remembrance of sin. Now pick it up, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 9. Go back to Hebrews chapter 9. And I know we're reading quite a bit in, uh, of the book of Hebrews, but this is very powerful in understanding the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ. Go back, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 9 and read with me, beginning at verse number 11. But Christ becoming an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and of ashes, uh, the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, watch it, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of bulls and goats could not purge the conscience the blood of Christ could under the old law with the blood of bulls and goats there was a remembrance of sin with the sacrifice of Christ the blood of Christ God says in Hebrews 8 verse number 12 their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more and so as we think about the book of Hebrews we can sum up everything from Hebrews 7, verse number 19. For the old law made nothing perfect, but a bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw near to God. Friends, the bringing in of a better hope, it has to do with the, co the new covenant of Christ. It has to do with the sacrifice of Christ. It has to do with the blood of of Jesus Christ. Now as we stop and think about this, we see that Jesus had a lot to say about blood. He had a lot to say about his blood being shed on the cross. In John chapter 12 verse number 24, Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it biteth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And our Lord would go on to say in chapter 12, verse number 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That whole context in John chapter 12 has to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ where he shed his blood. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse number 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. As we study our Bibles, hopefully on a daily basis, we study under a covenant that has been sealed in the precious blood of Christ. That's what makes the new covenant better. That's what makes the new covenant superior, according to Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 6. The old covenant was based upon the blood of bulls and goats. The new covenant is based upon the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that will wash away our sins. And because of the blood of Christ, the new covenant is an everlasting covenant. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 20. In other words, there's not going to be another covenant. We live under the new covenant. The new covenant is the covenant that we're going to be judged by. And so go back to this mystery that we introduced at the beginning of the lesson. As we think about the mystery, one of the main points in God's plan, whether we're talking about the salvation that we have in Christ, or whether we're talking about that fellowship is blood. Without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9 verse 22, there is no remission of sins. Hebrews 9 verse number 26, Christ appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
The emphasis is strong concerning the blood of Christ. There is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now let's make some application from what we've said. From this foundation that we lay from the Old Testament and New Testament. Consider this application. Turn over, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll spend the rest of our time, and I know time is, is getting away from us, but let's make the application. What we said does us no good if we don't make the application. And so consider the application of Ephesians chapter 2. As you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is showing us how God can take those who are dead in sin and make them alive. And that's a wonderful thing to know. That has to do with that mystery that, we're taught, that we have already mentioned in Ephesians chapter 3. And so as you're reading Ephesians 2, God is showing us how he can take those who are dead in sin and make them alive. Begin reading with me. In Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3. And what we see in these verses is that salvation is from sin. Notice this. Salvation is from sin. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What do we learn in these verses? Sin is a serious Serious thing. Sin is something that, that we all struggle with, according to Romans 3, verse number 23. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 20, There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. It doesn't matter who you are. We all struggle with sin. Sin is a transgression of God's law. 1 John 3, verse number 4. Sin is something that we commit. It's not something that we inherit. As the prophet Isaiah was speaking about Jesus, the atoning Lamb of God, you remember what he says in verse number 6? All we like sheep have gone astray. We're not born astray. We go astray. But sin is something that we all struggle with. And because of sin, because we have violated God's holy law, we subject ourselves to God's holy wrath. Psalm 7, 11, God is angry with the wicked. And so salvation is from sin. Now read with me Ephesians 2 verses 4 and 5. And we'll see that salvation is by God's mercy, love, and grace. Consider what Paul says in verse number 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. Mercy, love, and grace. Those words are, are, are a part of heaven's vocabulary. Words that, that we need to understand as it relates to salvation. Stop and think about mercy. The idea of God not giving us what we deserve. I believe you'll see that in Jeremiah's words in Lamentations 3 verse number 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Again mercy. The idea of God holding back judgment that we deserve. And giving us opportunity to make it right with God. And not only mercy, but we also read about God's love as it relates to salvation. John 3 verse number 16. Love put into action. Not just verbalized, but love put into action. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be 
the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4 verse number 10. God demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's mercy. God holding back judgment. God's love in providing a means. Providing a substitutionary sacrifice. And then we read about God's grace. God giving us what we don't deserve. You see, God gives us what we need, not what we deserve. And what we need more than anything is salvation. In Psalm 103 verse 10, the psalmist says that God has not dealt with us after our sins, nor hath he rewarded us according to our iniquities. Friends, that's God's grace. For by grace you are saved through faith. Ephesians 2 verse number 8. As you think about God's grace in an acrostic fashion, we see God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. It costs God his very best. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that ye through his poverty might be made rich. Great commentary on 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 is Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 6. How Christ emptied himself of his equality. How he took upon himself flesh. How he was obedient to the Father's will. How he humbled himself and offered himself as a sacrifice. Why? Because he loves me so. He loves me. He loves you. And then number three, we see that salvation is into life. Salvation is from sin. By God's mercy, by his love, by his grace. And then number three, we see that salvation is into life. Verse one, verse number five. And you hath he made alive who were dead in sins. The one thing a dead man needs the most is not a coffin. It's life. And that's what we have in Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus Christ provided for you and me. John 10 verse number 10. In 1 John 5 verse 11, the apostle John says, And this is the record, that ye have, may have eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Those who are outside of Christ are dead in their sins. They are lost in sin. They are without hope. But here in Ephesians chapter 2, we see how God can restore life again. How does God do that? Drop down to verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, listen to it. You're made nigh. You are made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. We can draw near to God through the blood of Christ. We have peace with God through the blood of Christ, Colossians 1 verse 20. Our peace treaty with God is written in the blood of Christ. We have propitiation through faith in his blood, Romans 3 verse number 25. We have redemption through the blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19. For as much as you know, you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold received by tradition of your fathers, but you've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We have the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ according to the riches of his grace, Ephesians 1 verse 7. We have justification through the blood of Christ, Romans 5 verse number 9. What does that mean, justification? When my sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, God treats me just if I've never sinned. We are justified through the precious blood of Christ. And then we come to the last point of this context. Salvation is into life through faith. Verse 8, for by grace you are saved 
through faith. The kind of faith that the Apostle Paul is talking about is an obedient faith to God's will. Faith is joyful trust conjoined with obedience. I want you to read a verse with me in this context. Read with me in Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 6. It's speaking about God raising us up and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here we're learning about God raising us up. How does he do that? The same way he raised his son. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 19. Paul wants them to understand the power that raised Jesus Christ. Because it's the same power that raises us from the deadness of sin. When does God do that? When is the power of God brought to bear that raises us from the deadness of sin and make us alive? You'll have to read this with me. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 verse number 12. You'll see the answer to that question. Again, it's the power of God that raises us from the deadness of sin. When is that power brought to bear? Colossians 2 verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him. Through the faith of the working or operation of God who raised him from the dead. The same power that raises, that raised Jesus from the dead raises us from the deadness of sin when we are baptized into Jesus Christ. In John chapter 19 verse number 34, as Jesus Christ hung on the cross, you remember the soldiers would come back to the cross. They were going to break his legs if he wasn't dead. But when they came to the cross, Jesus was already dead. And it says in John 19 verse 34 that that soldier pierced his side. It immediately water and blood flowed from his side. In death, Jesus Christ shed his blood. Now read with me Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. In death, Jesus shed his blood. Listen to what Paul says now. Romans chapter 6, verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, where he shed his blood? Baptism. Baptism is so important when it comes to salvation, according to 1 Peter 3, verse number 21. Before God can raise anybody, a person has to first be buried. And the only way that a person can be buried is in baptism. Now, we're not saying that baptism alone will save a person. It's a culmination of God's plan of salvation... Of hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, repenting of our sins, confessing Christ, and being baptized into Christ. But before God will raise somebody from the dead and make them alive, that person has to be buried in Christ. And one is buried in Christ in baptism where Christ shed his blood. And that's when the power of God is brought to bear. That is how God can take someone who is dead in sin and make them alive. Look at Romans 6 verse number 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. What is that form of doctrine? It's the death. It's the burial in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the Corinthians heard in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. They heard the power of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How Christ died for their sins. How Christ provided that substitutionary sacrifice. How Christ provided that atonement for sin. They heard the good news of the gospel. In Acts chapter 18 verse 8. 
the background to their conversion. It says this, the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. What did they hear? They heard the gospel. What did they believe? They believed the gospel, the good news concerning the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And they were baptized into Christ. And they had their sins washed away by the blood of Christ. And the power of God was brought to bear, raising them from the deadness of sin. How do you know that, Clay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, Paul just listed out their transgressions. And he says, and such were some of you. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. Friends, it is the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. But in baptism, we contact the blood of Christ. In Revelation 1, 5, the Lord says, or John says, unto him that loved us and washed away our sins in his own blood. Connect that with Acts 22, verse 16, when Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling upon the name of the Lord. Friends, I'm here to tell you tonight, there is forgiveness with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. God has promised to forgive you when we meet his terms of pardon that are found in the New Testament. It doesn't matter what you've done. And I realize People can do some pretty terrible things. But we know the answer for those who are outside of Christ, who are in darkness. We know the answer for those individuals is the blood of Jesus Christ. It might be that you've come tonight dead in sins. You don't have to leave like that. You can leave here alive. You can leave here forgiven. You can leave here justify well clay i just don't know if god will forgive me friend that's what god has promised to do in psalm 103 verse 11 as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our sins from us don't lose sight of that passage it doesn't say from the north to, to the south do you realize that if you go north, eventually you'll go south? If you go south, you'll eventually go north. But you think about as far as the east is from the west. You can't measure that. You can keep going east and you will always go east. You can keep going west. You will always go west. What's the point? God will forgive your sins. That's what he has promised to do. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross, to provide that atonement for sin, that substitutionary sacrifice. And so tonight, if you never obeyed the gospel, we plead with you. We plead with you tonight. Why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, and you'll walk out those doors this, tonight as a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new in Christ through his blood, 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17. It might be that you are a child of God. Don't ever lose sight of the power of the blood as a New Testament Christian. As long as we're on this earth as Christians, sin is something that we will always struggle with. Sin is a fact of my past, but now it's a fight in the present. And as I strive to walk in the light, it's a lifestyle, friends. As long as I'm striving to walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7 through 10, the blood of Jesus Christ continually forgives me of my sins. He that covereth his sins will not prosper, Proverbs 28, verse number 13. But whoso confesseth them and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And that's what God has promised to his children. I will be merciful to you. 
I will cleanse you of your sins as you walk in the light. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. There is power in the blood. Don't ever forget that. If you need to respond to heaven's invitation tonight, won't you please come right now as we stand and as we sing.